Good evening, everyone. And welcome to this wonderful occasion today. My name is Reverend Mbaba Henry Odun Lebron. I am an interfaith minister as well as a Yoruba Lukumi priest. I am honored to be here and I'm honored that so many of you today have taken the time to be here. I just want you to just close your eyes for a minute just to sort of relax for a second and just concentrate on your breath. Take a deep breath and relax. Just relax so that we can let go of the day and be in the now, presently here at this moment. One more breath. And open your eyes, relaxing. Before we begin to give honor to the Creator, we must give honor to the native people of this land. We must give honor for all that was taught by them to this continent called the Turtle Continent by native people. We're going to commence by saluting and giving salutations to the east, to the north, to the south, and to the west, to Father Sky, to Mother Earth, and to all the spirits of this land that have supported all of us through all these years. I will now start a libation. A libation is a way of honoring the ancestors through the African traditions by pouring water or sometimes um, spirits on the ground to honor. We use water because water is the most simplest element and the highest conduit and way of communing with God. If we have nothing in the world to give God as an offering, water is always available. Omi tutu, fresh water. Ile tutu, freshen this, this home. Ona tutu, freshen our road. Ariku babawa, freshen our ancestors. Ariku mojuba olofi. Blessing be of God the Creator. Mojuba lo dumare. Blessing be of the female aspect of the Creator. Mojuba sheda. Mojuba koda. Blessing be to the those teachers that came before us. Mojuba babato be. Blessing be to those mothers and fathers who came before us. Moyuba Bobo Egungun, blessing be to all the ancestors that made and made our way here and paved the path for us to be here. But we have to remember how we all got here. It wasn't by coincidence, but it was by the effort of our ancestors that made it, in their efforts, made it happen that we are able to enjoy this place, this now moment. Moyuba Orisha, blessing be to the divinities that God has as emissary to take care of, of all of us. And Moyuba, Bobo, Baba Locha, Iya Locha, Kekowaile, blessings be to all the highest priest and all of the priests who take care of the land, take care of the traditions, and take care of all of us. Ashe. Amen. We're going to do an affirmative prayer. God, you are love, you are source, for you are the beginning of everything. You are the sun beaming in our faces the gentle breeze whispering in our ears, a mother's touch, your omnipresence. We see you in our brother 
and sisters' faces, on the oceans, rivers, streams, trees, and landforms. We are the constant state of awe at your magnificence. You are wisdom, intelligence. You are the all in all. We know that you are in us and express yourself as us. We dwell, <clears throat> we dwell on this divine intelligence. We breathe and live in your truth. Our sister, Alice Walker, is your channel of pure expression and genius. She has a loving relationship with you, God, and you respond to her unconditionally. God, we know that this book entitled Taking the Arrow Out of Your Heart is your creation. It will assist us in all our personal transformation and the understanding of others, our community, and ourselves. We know that these poems will inspire us all, support and heal us in all aspects of our lives. We are grateful to you, God, our ancestors and divinities for all that you have and continue to do for us, for the opportunity to share this evening in support and solidarity with our sister, Alice Walker. We anticipate with much joy in our hearts the pure success of this book and the pleasure we will have reading this insightful and, and inspiring words. God, we are so grateful for you. We are so thankful for what you have done to us all in your love. Thank you, God. With much gratitude today, we give you thanks. We give you, we ask you to bless us. And with this, I release these words in much thankfulness fullness, gratitude, ashe, amen. I have listened to you and Lucille my whole life. Sometimes when I have had the blues, I have listened to you and thought, he can't be all that bad. I'm on this planet while he is too, and he is singing. It's hard to take this leaving of us that you've done, and yet how tired, how exhausted you must be singing to us all those years. And what did you eat, I ponder? Pondering your portliness, especially in the early days at the back door of how many of those respectable establishments. You know that word irrepressible? That describes the joy and pain of our resistance to dullness, giving up, wearing out? This is what I've thought of you. Who knew what kept you going? except the spirit that refused to, sur to surrender despair. When she was three or four, I took my daughter to hear you sing in Mississippi. You were amazing. My favorite word and observation about life. And you, large and dark and radiant with your special brand of unstoppable joy, kiss her with warm delight cheek and smiled at her father and me outlawed in the land. And we stood in awe. This painting by Sherrod Van Dyke. I encountered one day in her studio in Amsterdam. You were on one easel, Billy Holiday on another. I chose Billy, but the painting of you never left my heart. 12 years later or something like that, I called Van Dyke and she remembered perfectly how much I wanted you. Guess what, she said. When I said, alas, I can afford that green BB, I still have it. And so you came across the ocean across the continent, across my living room, to my rest where I can see you every day, the greenness of your skin, testifying a word you love to your supreme earthliness. Thank you for being here while I am here, while we are here, you radiant soul. Thank you for your guidance, truth, 
honesty, passion, sincerity, most importantly, most beautiful of all, your charm I found. Thank you for your special darkness that illuminates both shadow and light, that magic, all those days and nights on the road. You gave all you had, your ways, all of your dying wealthy. Thank you for teaching. Thank you for reaching. Thank you, cause we did not have money for fancy futon sittings with doctors who had spectral eyelids. See, our therapy sessions resided in the verses of the person whose rhymes meant a connection, which meant a weapon, which meant assault in my possession. See, my position was to listen even if the red lines got busted. See, my position was to listen even if my mind was messed up. Hmm. Every woman wonders where her secret lies. See, I said my position was to listen even if I was destined. This tomboy who loved rapping, like girls that like rap, hated tight curls, loved skull caps and basketball. Shade baby dolls, toy cars, and all that. But what can you call that when every sample of a woman was a damsel or a damn hoe or a dusty trophy waiting at the lip of a mantle? See, and that's where feminism dismantled rap for me. No room to exit the chimneys, no heat, but plenty room to consume hate and plenty more for envy. Still, our stomachs were empty with the fingertips at the radio so I let the statistics tempt me to write this just in the fifth grade, y'all. Listen, I'm the best at the dress ups. In the mess in your chest up, I leave a hole in your vest. Look like spatters of ketchup. And while my statuses go up, you must be quicker to lesson. I was counting my stacks and you were over there stressing. I'm secure with my own while you constantly checking, taking women on your deck to make a kiss on your neck. And yo, she doggy you, dude. Thought that you would expect that you'll use a weenie beanie, baby. Thought that you would expect that. Hey, yo, the matter, the meaner in them. Also, the queen of bringing hits like Serena, wicked man, you the dreamer. And I'm the girl you want to be with, no Victoria's Secrets. Looking for a girl to sleep with and planning to keep it. Huh? And y'all can keep that. <laughs> Yeah. Because in the fifth grade, that was my second rap. I can't believe I got sucked in that, so I had to find my way, and naturally, I second that. South side to them section cats, North 25 back to Stuyvesant, down the hill back to Carteret, and on Hermitage. On Hermitage. That's where little Benny Wop and Sean Carter met. Not only to give me a blank road map, but to give me a portrait, to portray the poor kids to see the streets of something else besides a trap, so I have no choice but to use this voice. I get nasty with my wrath because it allows smooth roughness to help fill voice to speak to little girls who has little interest in boys other than to compete. Where running the streets could possibly only mean allowing your play sneakers and the gravel to meet until the fast one touches the finish line disguised as two hands, both hands. That was our vision of a resurrection. Forward moving was the only sign of perfection and keeping it real was the only sign of perfection, so no sir. We did not have money to talk to someone who got paid to listen. Our only counsel hugged our ears and exchanged hardship for lyrical prescriptions, so we are the doctors and the clients, and we fulfill every requirement between those two spectrums. More than PhD qualified, so when a new guy comes, we don't use our eyes to inspect them. No, we dap them, we head phone, mic check them, and allow our ears to accept or reject them. Protecting our homes with deadly musical weapons is not only what's expected, is the B-side of the record when the tables are turned. Is the chills that we feel after the CD gets burned, after the record gets dropped to your seat. This seat is not equipped for this bodily detox, so give me a Dougie Fresh beatbox or a Pete Rock track. Give me the chills on the hill as this lawn was back. Put public enemy in front of me so I can feel pro-black, no matter fact. You can sit down and see the crowd react, see the gospel detach, see my bodily beat rap. Vengeance of God. Yahweh! Yahweh, Yahweh, oh Yahweh, you know I love you, no one above you, will you hold me tight, yeah, yeah, because in night time, when I lie in my pillow, I cry every morning. The smile is a warning. The devil don't want it. <laughs> Yahweh! 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 Oh, Yahweh! You know I love you. No one above you. Will you hold me tight? 
Yeah, yeah, yeah. Because in my time, if I cry in my pillow, I smile every morning. The child is a warning. The devil, the devil don't want it.
We are grateful that you've decided to spend your Friday night with us as we all celebrate the release of Alice Walker's newest book of poems, Taking the Arrow Out of the Heart. As you may know, the book is presented in both English and in Spanish, and this timely collection of nearly 70 works bears witness to our troubled political moment while chronicling a life well lived. It is such a blessing that Alice Walker sincerely wants us to celebrate life and honor the divine within ourselves. It's really a blessing, right? She really cares. She really cares about us. Tonight's program has been presented in partnership with Atria Books, which is an imprint of Simon & Schuster. And I want to acknowledge Yona Demones and Milena Brown. So if we could please give them a the hand. They've been wonderful partners. They're continuously supporting black women <laughs> in presenting their best works, and we need fierce supporters like them in our lives. I really I have this bouquet of flowers for Yona. She's, she's struggled with um, cancer, actually, and has um, been going through chemotherapy all summer as we've been planning this beautiful offering, yes, for Miss Walker, but also for all of you. So I really want to acknowledge and thank you for your leadership and your continued support, not only of me, but of all the beautiful black women, the black girls that are gonna be feel, the, gonna feel empowered and inspired and motivated to create <laughs> because you're putting our work out in the world. So thank you so much. It is my pleasure to introduce tonight's conversation between the brilliant and kind Alice Walker and scholar, writer, and activist, Salamisha Tillett. <laughs> Salamisha Tillett is the Henry Ruggers Professor of African American and African Studies and Creative Writing Programs at Rutgers University, Newark, and the founding director of the Newark School Justice Initiative at Express Newark. She's also a regular critic for the New York Times. She is the author of Sites of Slavery, Citizenship and Racial D Democracy in Post-Civil Civil Rights America, and is currently working on two book projects, In Search of the Color Purple with Abrams Press and All the Rays, Mississippi Goddamn, <laughs> and, the new, and the World Nita Simone Made with Eco Books. In 2003, her and her sister, co-founded A Long Walk Home, a Chicago-based nonprofit that uses art to empower young people and end violence against girls and women and is subject to the writer of Story of a Rape Survivor, multimedia performance. So I'll, without further ado, I'm happy to introduce you to, to Salamisha. the good fortune of being in conversation with uh, Alice Walker this evening. And um, I would like to invite you to the stage. Oh my. Not only have I had the good fortune of being in conversation with uh, Miss Alice Walker this evening, but a couple of weeks ago, my sister and I took the voyage to Northern California, and I had the opportunity of spending two uh, glorious days with you. And there's something you said that day that I held on to, um, and that you know sometimes you don't have to spend, and it's also in your book here in terms of your relationship to your translator, that you don't have to spend a lot of time with someone for them to have a meaningful impact. So I wasn't sure if I'd ever see you again, so I was like holding on to that. Mm -hmm. And now that I have this gift, I feel so blessed. Um, and so there's something for me as an avid reader of your work 
um, as a student of your work and as someone who's been deeply molded by your politics and your um, poetry. And that when I met you, I didn't realize that your starting place is a, as a healer. I, I thought of you as a writer and an activist. And it seems kind of silly because obviously your work is deeply about healing. Um, but I felt that energy so profoundly when I was with you. And so that brings me to the title of this collection of poetry. And for those of you who haven't had a chance to read it yet, she, um, Alice writes in the introduction that the original title was uh, The Long Road Home, inspired by um, the poem that you have here about Muhammad Ali, and that you were invited to do a lecture um, at a university, and you changed the title um, of the book as, as a result. And so here you say that, you know, but life will change course, and so you're give, invited to give this talk. And at that talk, you talk to them about how that arrow many feel in their hearts is not theirs alone. Remind them it is worthwhile to, to train to learn how to remove it. So what do you mean by this arrow, this, this wound that many of us have, and this journey of taking it out? Like, what the, it's a metaphor, but obviously it, it changed the course of the book for you in many ways. Well, when I was um, very deeply in love with someone and the relationship ended, I was in incredible pain. Uh, this, is, this is leading you from the romantic angle. We're gonna get to the other angle. But I was very hurt uh, and the pain, I don't know how many of you have had this kind of suffering. Oh. <laughs> <laughs> That's what I thought. Uh, yeah, you know, no matter what you do, it's just there. You wake up in the morning, it's there. You go to bed at night, it's there. Well, anyway, this went on for far too long, and I really was at the end of my wits. And then just by chance, someone brought uh, some, a tape by Pema Chodron, the Buddhist nun, called Awakening Compassion. <clears throat> and she was talking about how part of our problem with our suffering is that we... We are, we're shot in the heart with an arrow, not just a romantic one or one, you know, where you're having a terrible time with someone. But in any case, you're, you're suffering. But instead of actually taking the arrow out or learning how to take it out, you stand there and you scream at the person who shot you. Ooh. And, and what a waste of time that turns out to be. So, what is important to do is to learn how to take it out. Um, the, the, whoever shot you, they're gonna be somewhere, you know, doing whatever they do and not even thinking about how much pain you're in. So you might as well just not even be concerned about them. Um, so part of the, the practice is, is founded in meditation, which I hope a lot of you do, because in this period, it is what will help you a lot. Uh, and a very quick way of describing uh, one of the ways that, that this particular kind of meditation that she taught me as I was lying there for a full year of suffering. Uh, imagine that this room is completely filled with very hot, heavy, dark, uh, like, you know, we had big fires in Mendocino where I live, so I'm describing basically what I saw out of my window. Uh, but that kind of smoke where, where it, you can't even hardly breathe. But imagine that in this room. This room is full of that, that smoke. And you need to be able to inhale all of it. You need to sit up straight and draw it all of it, every corner of it that's in here, wherever it is. You take that into your body. Uh, and, and as you're doing that, you, you imagine that you are taking in you know, all the weight of you know, the world and, and your own suffering and whatever is really plaguing you. And then you, you hold it just for a minute and then on the out breath, uh, you decide right, right before you let it go, you decide what would you rather have? You know, this is what we got. We got floods, we got earthquakes, we got tsunamis, we got storms. We have, you know, presidency. Um, <laughs> but what would you rather have, you know? And so you, you conjure that. And for me, it, it is a, a, you know, being on the beach. I love the ocean. Um, 
and you, you, you breathe that out. But the catch here is that you, you breathe it out, whatever it is that you want to replace the, the arrow, the suffering, the smoke, whatever it is that you want to replace that with, you don't breathe it out for just yourself and your family and your friends. You breathe it out for everyone so that you, you cover the earth with your own dream of what is wonderful, which would mean, in, in our case, if you're dealing with the beach, we would cover the planet with people all over being able to walk out of their doors as they have done for so many hundreds and thousands of years to a clean beach, you know, to wonderful fishing, to great swimming, uh, and that's what you wish for everyone. And this eventually begins to relieve your own suffering. Does that make sense to you? See? Hmm. <laughs> so, I mean, the image of the beach and many, many years of people coming to it and now in some ways it not being, you know, being corrupted and, and changing and, and the environment. One of the things I, I was curious about with this book is um, the way in which it defies like national borders. Um, or at least you tr you're such a global citizen that in terms of topics and countries and, and people that you empathize with, it's such a terrain. Um, but this is your first book. That's because I didn't make the borders. Yeah. You know? Mm -hmm. And I don't really respect them as something that's going to keep me separate. Mm. <laughs> Sorry, but... <laughs> yeah. I was thinking about the turn to, uh, and we talked about this before, but that it's bilingual. And do you, do you see this as your first clearly bilingual book? It's in English and Spanish. And so practically, I know you live in Mexico, or you have a house in Mexico, um, and so you can talk about that a little bit. But when I, was, when I read about it being in Spanish, um, it was during the summer, um, and the intense crisis around uh, children and parents being detained and separated. And so I thought, what a timely, I mean, you're always both ahead of time and on time, um, but I Aquarians thought, are like that. Okay, there are. <laughs> <laughs> okay. Um, so why do this book in two languages? Well. And, and the Spanish and English being the two okay, languages. Okay, but yeah. then I do want to go back to Muhammad yeah. Ali yeah. And, and the changing of the title. Oh, I just okay. got off on a tangent. Oh, okay. Oh, we can go okay. there. You can, no, no, yeah. no, no, no. Yeah. Uh, well, actually, yeah, since the, the early 80s, I've lived in Mexico as much as I can. Uh, and that usually means a few months out of the year. And I have really good friends there. Uh, and I have, you know, grandchildren by, you know, my friends. Uh, and people that I really love. <clears throat> However, because I'm constantly writing in English and rather long things in English, uh, even though I have the best intentions, my Spanish um, study just just falters, which means that my Spanish, and I can get around, but my Spanish is actually poor. It's really poor, and I'm very aware of it. Uh, so that when my friends often say to me, you know, well, Alicia, you know, what, what, what do you really do? I mean, what, what are you doing? Why are you, what are you, why are you writing in that book, you know? And I, I felt the need to, um, especially on my blog, because more people relate to, you know, blogs and, and the internet uh, and the computer. I felt the need to, to um, have my work in Spanish so that my friends could know what I do. They, they you know, I'm a mystery. They may think I'm running something. <laughs> Um, <clears throat> and so, you know, I, lucky for me, I met this incredible Cuban uh, many, many years ago when I was in Cuba, and he has become my translator. And so we, it's wonderful how it works. I write, you know, poems or whatever, and I send them to Manuel, and within three or four days, if he's not, you know, if the, co the computer situation there is sometimes <clears throat> very tricky. <clears throat> But when he can work on, on my, my, what I send him, within days I can put it up in Spanish. And I just love that, you know, and, and I, I feel like, you know, just as my Spanish is not great, well, their English is not great. So we kind of, you know, we're just working our way as, 
as well as we can toward each other. And that is what I think we can do. Mm -hmm. I don't think we will all ever really have everybody else, you know, other people's stuff down totally. Mm -hmm. You know, we would like to. But that doesn't mean that we can't do what we can. And so, you know, I, I love the people that I love, you know, in countries where they speak Spanish. And I, I just want to be more known, hmm. you know? Mm -hmm. Yeah. Mm. Muhammad Ali, the change in title. Oh, yeah, about Muhammad Ali. <laughs> well, <clears throat> you know, the long road home, and, and what's so amazing is that you, that's the name of your organization. The long walk home, uh-huh. The long, yeah, the yeah. long road home. Mm -hmm. is, is yours the long walk home? Mm -hmm. The long walk home. Mm -hmm. Yeah, mine is the long road home. Mm -hmm. um, Basically, I, I wrote that for Muhammad Ali because he was so inspiring to me, <clears throat> not as a boxer, because actually I can't bear it when people are hitting each other um, in the ring. I, I Anyway, um, <laughs> but what I loved about him was that even though he beat up people for a living, mm -hmm. when they tried to force him to mm -hmm. fight against the Vietnamese people, he refused hmm. and went to jail. You know, he just said, well, come and just take me to jail. I'm not gonna kill these people. Uh, now to me, that represents part of his long road home. You know, we, we, we get on a road uh, home if we're lucky, if we're lucky. We get on that long road home. And what is that? What is that road? It's the road to the true self. It's, so whatever you think of Muhammad Ali, and you know, he had his sexist ways and his, you know, whatever. But when it came to what truly mattered at a time that really made a great deal of difference in the way our people could see who they had to remain, you know, people who don't just kill other people, you know, because somebody tells you. He did what was right, you know, and, and that is, you know, so inspiring because we hope that when our time comes, we can say, no, just take me to jail. You know, FEMA, just come get me. I won't do what, what you're asking. I will not. Because the long road home is to get you to who you really are, where you actually live. I mean, we can exist. That's what we do already, a lot of us. But to actually live, you know. So anyway, but then I went to Stanford mm -hmm. and they were talking about something else and somehow I changed the title. <laughs> <laughs> uh -oh. well, so, I mean, 2015 and 2016, these are from those two years um, that many of, all of us in this room have, have lived through. Um, so I guess I wanted to talk a little bit about the process of both writing poetry in response to those years and then blogging, right? You're doing these, and then I'm assuming you're still taking, keeping journals, are you still? Well, a lot of my journal now is on my website. Okay, so that, yep. Uh, because I felt um, all along that it was crazy to write something and then wait for it to be published a whole year. Mm -hmm. <laughs> because by a whole, by a year, after a year, who are you? Hmm. You know? Mm -hmm. And with my memory, uh, who knows? Mm -hmm. So now I, I do, I love it. I love the, the immediacy of it. I like, you know, to just send things out on the air. Uh, it seems very natural to me. Hmm. I mean, so I think it's probably astonishing to a lot of people in the audience who read much of your published work that there's, so for it, the poetry is, itself is a re urgent response. And then the blog is an, an even more immediate response for you. Is that how do, do you see them as doing different things or? You know, it feels just very natural. Mm. I mean, I, I um, in fact, you know, I, it, the problem is if I talk about something, then I probably won't write about it, but I'm gonna talk about it anyway and just hope that I forget that I've talked about it. <laughs> um, 
But you know, I've been having a lot of trouble with the pronoun situation. You know, the, the them, the her, the they. And, and I've been taking myself to task, you know, because I can't seem to quite get it right, you know, and, and I don't have many people to practice with. Um, but I just read a poem from uh, Scoot This Rock by someone who, uh, just in, his, in, they, in their poem, made so much sense that I got it. I think for the first time I really understood. Mm. So this is a poet who um, refers to themselves themselves as they, them, and, and their uh, ancestry is Cherokee, white, um, oh God, two or three other things that I can't quite remember. But the, 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 what, what really impacted me was that I looked at this person's, this, their face, and I could see exactly what they meant. And that in a way it was so right mm -hmm. to figure out how to acknowledge all of those entities, in, a, in addition, transgender, femme, um, got a lot, I mean, really, you'd have to look this up. <laughs> um, but, you know, I, I really see now how liberating it can be to be able to, in language, acknowledge all of your parts. It's amazing. So, so I was thinking, you know, about myself, about how uh, she, her, is fine, and that's what I'm going to stick with because honestly, I don't know if I can get all of them, you know, together. Uh, but I do understand that if I truly wanted to acknowledge my possibly Nigerian, um, Ghanaian, Cherokee. Um, Irish, Scottish, English ancestry, I would have to say they, wouldn't I? Doesn't that make sense? I mean, it's so clear. Uh, what was your question? <laughs> I think what you were answering was what poetry gives us. Because in that poem, you were able to see, the, the poem gave you the answer to something you were struggling with, yeah. right? It just was laid bare. And I, and so my question to you was about the difference between your avid blogging and then your, your writing poetry. Um, but I mean, I think you, you kind of, you answered it like with poetry. Yeah, I just write the poems and then if they, if I feel like they are shareable, mm -hmm. I put them on the blog. Mm -hmm. And like I wrote two poems for, for the audience uh, here at the museum. I don't know if you, well, you're probably not the same audience, but I wonder if you saw <laughs> them because I went home after, after my last visit and you, you'd have, well, I don't know, probably not you, but <laughs> <laughs> assume that it's you. <laughs> and anyway, the audience had been so wonderful. I, I was so touched that I, I went home and I wrote these poems and I dedicated them to you and I put them right on my blog so you could see them right away. Um, and, and that it felt really good because that also is what poetry does. Mm. It makes you feel really good, even when it's sad. Mm -hmm because you're able to add to the, you know, imagined discussion um, what it is that, that you see. And, and it's like everything, it's an offering, mm -hmm. you know? So is it different for you than writing, because you have so many forms, so short stories, essays, novels, blogging, mm -hmm. poetry, you wrote a screenplay. So are they all different? Experience. I mean, are, they, are you trying to do something different with the different genres? Or I know the way you talk about writing, it kind of, it's a calling, it kind of comes to you. But do you actually think of the genres as doing different things? Or are they oh, all yeah, well, you have to. If you're writing a screenplay, mm -hmm. for instance, mm -hmm. you know, they want a screenplay. They don't want, you know, a book of poems. Yeah. <laughs> they can hardly <laughs> handle the screenplay. Yeah, um, yeah I, I feel... Um, just so incredibly grateful uh, when 
you know, the inspiration happens, hmm. you know, that, that it's, it's like being given this wonderful understanding of something or this wonderful flowering of, of a dream or, a, or, you know, just a, a wish to be able to, um, to praise something, for instance. I mean, I, I've written many poems just in praise of the wonder of, you know, where we are, wherever mm. this is, you know? Mm. I mean, just the, the, the magic of, of being humans here on this planet and not having much of a clue how we got here, um, going to church and hearing these tales, but really they start to wear thin. And then you're left with, you know, the, the true mystery of it, which I think is preferable. You know, just, just be in the mystery of how amazing it is you know, it's not going to be solved in our lifetime about, you know, how it happened. So we might as well just really enjoy, you know, those trees out there, you know, that park. I love Prospect Park. It's just beautiful. So in your note about the translator, um, Manuel Garcia Verdesia? Verdesia? Verdesia. Verdesia. Mm -hmm. um, you talk about that moment when you realize that you and eight or other so beings were soulmates. Mm -hmm. And then you said something that was really profound. I mean, many things are profound, but this really stood with me. So you said, um, there was a luminosity to the moment that went straight to my heart and soul. None of us could imagine how many defeats lay ahead of us to their revolution, to my success as a mother and as an artist attempting to bring light. But we knew we were the ones offering ourselves to the journey, the task of trusting each other as companions on the way. And so one thing to open the book with this, um, even though the book is a reflection and a meditation on 2015 and 2016, it also is a retrospective in many ways with your homage to Muhammad Ali or to B.B. King, to Julian Bond, to many, many souls or spirits, and also to the civil rights movement itself. Mm -hmm. You dedicate, you have three dedications. One is to Coretta Scott, and Martin Luther King looms large in this pretty consistently. Yes. And so I was just wondering if you could talk about that movement back and forth between our, like our fierce present, but then also re re going back and either those figures have passed away and so we have to conjure them up in the present or you're summoning their energy for us in the present, I guess. Well, I'm concerned that we not forget. We are people who have been so fiercely loved Mm. We have been so loved, and it would be tragic if we forgot. You know, I mean, I, I feel so fortunate to have been with people who, you know, just offered themselves. You know, we never knew, they never knew what the end would be. You know that song, I'm going to run on, I'm going to run on a long time, see what the end will be? Well, that's how people were. And if we forget that, that we've been loved so much, uh, we will start to value ourselves less, and that would be really tragic. Mm -hmm. In fact, I was thinking, you know, before we came up here, <clears throat> about how black people are so lovable, you know, uh, <clears throat> and my understanding of, you know, that was you know, very strong, uh, especially in my younger years in high school. Um, but I can see that that feeling has been eroded as people have felt less and less lovable and less and less loved. So it's important to remind us, you know, by going back to these Julian Bond, Martin Luther King Jr., Fannie Lou Hamer, you know, Rosa Parks, all the people you think you know, but actually you just know the shadow. You know a little image that they put out there. They've even moved the people's birthdays, which is a terrible thing to do. And I mean that, you, you really should not celebrate people's birthdays on days that are not actually their birthdays. It really destroys the energy, it's a, it's a fracture. So, you know, I just, in writing these poems, I want to bring back to mind, or some, for some people for the first time, that yeah, you know, you, you've been loved by people who, who never knew you, you know, they, they just knew you know, that you were coming. That's all they knew. They didn't know you. They said, oh, no, they're, they, they're going to come and, 
you know, we got to prepare. And that's what they were doing. They were preparing a day for you that they didn't even think they'd see. So it's, it's so humbling when you see your, your people like that. So there's a, speaking of n not knowing that you're loved, um, you have a poem here for, uh, called Is Seely Actually Ugly? Mm -hmm. um, and I know when you and I talked, you were like, what else is there to say about the color purple? But then here it is. So, um, <laughs> I, you know, and you, write, you dedicate it to Cynthia Erivo. So I was wondering, you say it's a question that people either ask you or ask characters who play her or see the character Seely. And so I was wondering why you felt like you wanted to, why well, did you include well, that here? Well, okay, I, I know, I'll tell you. Um, okay. <laughs> <laughs> Well, you know, the Seely, the last Seely on Broadway was actually from London, and she was excellent. And one day she actually just said to me, you know, well, is she really ugly? Because I think if you're a smash on Broadway and, and the image that people are, are set up to have is that you're ugly, it is bound to weigh on you. I mean, you may be the strongest actor in the world, but if every time you come out, you feel like people expect you to be ugly, it's very, it's very harmful to you. So I wrote this poem uh, to help her understand how I was you know, also trying to help us understand beauty itself, um, but in a more prosaic way. What's, uh, what's really amazing about readers of the book and viewers of the film but especially readers of the book, is that even though Pa, who you know, who is um, you know a rapist and a you know terrible being, a horrible person, never tells the truth about anything, he is still believed by readers, even though in the book itself she is saying, for instance, "I am 14 years old." Then when Pa is trying to get rid of her <clears throat> by marrying her off. Uh, mister says, well, how old is she? And Paul says, she's near 20. Now, the, you know, the, what I'm showing you is that people believe basically what they want to believe. But in this case, they believe that she's ugly, but also that she has been, been abused in ways that would make you ugly. So if you are basically a slave to a horrible person who is sexually molesting you and abusing you for years, and you have to take care of his very terrible children, um, and do all the cooking and, and a lot of the plowing, uh, you would look very different from your sister who, who manages with your help to escape. So what, what happens though is that Celie's beauty uh, develops as she becomes aware of her own beauty, which she does through the, the grace and the beauty of another sister, another woman, which is a gift that we can give to each other. I mean, we know that so many people that are, are considered, quote, ugly, are really beautiful. Why don't we tell them? Why don't we just tell them? You know, just out of nowhere. I mean, they. They can be upset or whatever. But you know, you just tell them and then walk away. Well, gosh, you're beautiful, you know? Um, now, it will take a while for them to internalize this, but it's a lot better than having them feel like because they don't look like somebody on TV, you know, uh, joy and happiness and good fortune passed them by. It didn't. Oh yeah, I'm so so if you have Okay. <laughs> okay. Well, I will repeat exactly what she just said. Um uh, thank you June. Um if there, you all have questions, uh, so you have cards uh, that you're supposed to put questions on and so we're going to collect them and we'll pick a few um to ask Alice um uh, soon, but if you can make sure that you put your questions on the cards that are that you got when you entered the um auditorium that'd be great. So we'll collect them and then we'll choose from them. Um, so you have two poems that are kind of related to each other, I think. Um, they will always be more beautiful than you, and then the lesson. 
And I don't know if you want to read from either of those, but I... Yeah. Well, sorry. <laughs> You, you know the poem I really want to read, but I, I forget which page. And I've lost my reading. Let me tell me I can find it. You, huh? Let tell me the phone. I'll look for it for you. Okay. It's sweet people are everywhere. Yeah. yeah. But I can do that after. Uh, well, okay. Oh yeah, I think it's I think it's 193 actually. Yeah. <laughs> um, But I'd like to read it after the other two, or okay. after the other one, whichever you you want me to do one or two. I like the, I mean, it's up to you, really. Uh, they will always be more beautiful than you. Yeah, let's read that one. Let's follow the Healy thing, but the lesson is so, oh, I like the lesson. Okay, well, the lesson is short, so I can do maybe that one. What page are you talking about? But I do want to read the one, they will always be more beautiful than you, because this is, this yeah. is a medicine poem. It's a medicine poem for us, especially indigenous people everywhere, because, you know, we've suffered um, so horribly from people who have come to tell us how ugly we are, when just think about what they look like. <laughs> and, and I mean, no, 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 seriously. I mean, here, here they came in 100 degree weather wearing these metal suits. I mean, just, Really, and they didn't believe in hygiene. <laughs> you know, and there we were for the most part, you know, swimming in the ocean. Anyway. <laughs> so, so it's about, you know, looking at the hatred that we face really realistically. You know, as we now can look at Trump and see his treatment of Obama for what it is. You know, isn't that helpful? If we don't get anything else out of this, and we might not, it's a lesson there that is, is really, you know, really good to, to have and really just, you know, just keep it there. Just understand that, what's going on there. <clears throat> they will always be more beautiful than you. And this is, many of these poems are about Palestine, and uh, I was in Palestine, um, you wouldn't, you wouldn't believe what it's like. I mean, nothing could prepare you for it. And then another time I was trying to get there and uh, they wouldn't let the boat go. You know, that was trying. But in any case, they will always be more beautiful than you no matter what. They will always be more beautiful than you, the people you are killing. You think it is hatred that you feel, but it is really envy. You imagine if you destroy them, <clears throat> we will forget how tall they stood, how level their gaze, how straight their backs, how even the littlest ones, the littlest ones, stood their little ground. Meanwhile, you stand hunched as a cobbler in your absurd killer's gear yelling like a crazy person, your face contorted, dripping sweat from what would be with or without your lethal weapons, a bullying brow and feral chin. <clears throat> Killing everyone, but especially, especially children, for sport, looking cool in your own mind as you crunch bones beneath your boot that are still forming, conquering. Don't forget the entertainment value of your daily work for the folks back home who witness from the hillsides in their lounge chairs. What beautiful fun we are not like those people being broken over there, they tell each other. And for this moment, they are right, they're not. But what does this mean? What does this mean for broken humanity? Selfie this. This is called sweet people are everywhere. 
and this was written for a young friend who'd just gotten his first passport. Some of the people in Turkey are very sweet. Some of those in Afghanistan are very sweet. Some of the people in the Americas are very sweet. In Canada, too, some of the people are sweet. In Mexico, you will definitely find sweet people. Likewise, in the Sudan, there are sweet people among the Zulu in South Africa, and every language group in Africa has some sweet people in it. There are sweet people in Iceland and in Russia. There are many sweet people in Korea. There are millions of sweet people in China. There are sweet people in Japan. If the sweet people were the leaders in these historically warring Asian countries, they would treat each other much better. There are sweet people in the Congo. There are sweet people in Egypt. and sweet people in Australia. Many sweet people are in Norway. Numerous sweet people are in Spain. There are many sweet people in Ghana and Kenya, and sweet people also in Guam in the Philippines. There are sweet people in Cuba, many sweet people in Iran. There are sweet people in Libya and Colombia. Sweet people are in Vietnam. Sweet people exist in England and Burma. There are sweet people for sure in Ireland. Sweet people are in France. Sweet people are holding on in Syria. They're doing the same in Iraq. Some sweet people live in Venezuela. Many very sweet people live in Brazil. There are sweet people in Israel. And there are sweet people also in Palestine. Actually, in almost every house on the planet, there is at least one very sweet person <laughs> that you would be happy to know. Sweet people are everywhere. Being sweet, they must not be disappeared. We are lost if we can no longer experience how sweet human beings can be. Promise me never to forget this. No matter how far you go on this new passport, where you are directed to land your own sweet self, or who sends you. Hmm. So, um, the poem, I Believe the Women, which we talked about before, but we talked about it before two things happened, before Cosby, Bill Cosby was um, uh, sentenced and before uh, the Kavanaugh hearings and Dr. Ford had testified. Um, and so I said to you then, and I'll say it now, you, in your work, you, you always believe the women, meaning that you've um, highlighted or spotlighted or, or told, um, you're one of the, pioneers, at least for my generation, of breaking silences around um, sexual assault and uh, domestic or gender-based violence and interpersonal violence. Um, so I wanted to talk a little bit about this poem in this, like, three weeks later, um, and also in this moment of Me Too, because I think you both offer us a kind of, like, this book in general offers us both a diagnosis of our condition and also a way through it. Um, and I don't know if you want to read this poem or just talk about it, but, you know, what were you, th you wrote this, I guess, as the Me Too movement was gaining steam. I, I, I don't, what, what prompted, I believe, the women? All the stuff on television about mm. Bill Cosby and all these women that he drugged and, and you know, molested. Mm. Uh, and the, the people who were saying that they made it up um, and... At the same time, the people who had no compassion at all for him. I have to say, uh, and I do somewhere uh, lately, I'm concerned when we, you know, there's something we have to really think about, which is we can believe, you know, stories of, of you know, brutality, atrocity, violence, 
you know, and, and they're often very true. However, it's damaging to us if we cannot feel compassion for the person who's done the violence and the damage. So just think about it that way. So for me, um, I, I feel compassion for Bill. And I think, um, I think compassion is a feeling you really can't go wrong with. It's not like you're trying to you know, liberate him or free him or anything. What you're basically trying to do is liberate your own heart. You know, uh, because it, it just it just doesn't help us really to ever close down on people. Um, so that's part of it. And I was saying too in that poem, but there's a later poem. But in this poem, I'm talking about how uh, how in our culture and in many cultures, little boys by the time they are five have to be so confused about what it is to be a man and what they're supposed to be doing. Uh, there's a, in, in this context, I want to recommend a book called Perfect Peace by Daniel Black. And in this book, uh, it's set in the South, these, you know, black, it's a black family, and, it, and these people have had seven boys. The woman, you know, they had seven boy children, one after the other. And she just says, I'm sick of having boy babies. And the, the next one that comes, she turns into a girl and she dresses and names her perfect. And she, you know, dresses her like a girl and she, you know, goes through the whole thing. And eventually, of course, she's discovered. But what we learn is so, so many things about, you know, the gender issues that children grow up with and how confused they can be and how damaged. So just as I, I felt that my own grandparents, who are the basis of uh, some of the rotten men in purple, you know, just as they were damaged in different ways, and you know, it took a granddaughter to come so much toward the end of their lives to see the parts that they had tried to kill off in order to be men, you know. I mean, I got to see them, <laughs> I got to see the feminine in a way of my grandparents, grandfathers. I mean, where they were not trying to protect some weird thing. So that's kind of some of that, mm -hmm. you know? Yeah, thank you. Mm -hmm. So we're gonna turn it, well, I'm gonna pull from the questions from the audience. So, um, <laughs> so this is also a call to action. I don't know if you would like to do the call to action after we go through this list of questions or, but, but my final question will be, you know, what is the call to action that you would like us, what would you like us to do um, in terms of the healing that you propose here or just the political realities that we're in that you so beautifully really tackle and wrestle with and um, present to us in this book? Do you want to answer that now or you can meditate on it to like, well, I'm happy you mentioned meditation. <laughs> <laughs> okay. That's Be, because I, I really feel, uh, again, that you know, when I think about the civil rights movement, for instance, um, now it's true that in the South, the meditation state was accomplished in some of our churches. I mean, if you ever think about the, the calm and the, and the assurance of, of, of the soldiers of the civil rights movement, I mean, the, the warriors, a lot of that actually came out of our tradition of having a meeting place. A meeting place is pretty important. And that meeting place was our church and the singing of the, in the church and the, and the, the, the possibility you know, of, of being yourself, being loved, being surrounded by people who truly, you know, they didn't come in there uh, to do anything but support you and whatever you know, we were about to get into. So that is very essential, you know, to, to find um, a circle. That, that is something that I really recommend. Mm -hmm. uh, in my own case, one day we, my, my women friends and I decided that we need to have women's council. And I mean, you may want to have, you know, men and women, but at that point we, we felt like we had to be women. And we just basically picked up the phone and called 11 women that we knew and most of them came and, and came for the next 10 years. Mm. So, 
you know, it's, it's valuable to have an, uh, a structure, uh, but not one where you have an agenda exactly. One of the things that we decided was that we would never come into the circle with an agenda, that we would trust that whatever was the deepest need would arise, that that subject would, 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 would arise automatically, and it always did. I mean, it's one of the things I think that can happen, especially with women, maybe with other people too. Uh, so I would, I would recommend that, a lot of, a lot of sitting, a lot of um, getting to know who you really are, you know, because the other part of activism is knowing what you're willing to give up. You know, are you ready to give it all up? You may have to. And if you're not ready, you know, it, it's, it has to be a mess. And you don't want to leave here with your soul in a mess, really. So I think uh, I can agree to this question profoundly because my sister and I did not want to leave. I mean, I wanted to go back to my kids and my partner, so I did, that's true, but I did not want to leave your presence because you were so... Well, the question here is how do because you Because I loved you. That's why you didn't want to leave. that you're projecting to us, it's soothing after the nightmare of this past year. And I guess that's what I mean, like, you just emit so much goodness and serenity and love. And so uh, how do you maintain that, I guess? How do you, and I, you're a true empath. And I know you, I said this to you when I was leaving, um, that there's a Steven Spielberg quote about you that you're otherworldly. And what I realized is like, Alice is so worldly like she's so connect, like a plant dying is going to really, an animal, like everything you take in and you feel it so profoundly. So how do you, and I guess at, to this question, how do you work, how do you stay so still? You know, I like, think it's love actually. I mean, mm, it seems trite, but yeah. I really do. I think it is, and I think, it, I think I remember when I was little, I was really so little and I would feel so much love that I actually thought I would burst. <laughs> And, and so I figured I had to be really calm. <laughs> <laughs> I would just be really calm, you know. Oh, don't let them know. Mm. Yeah, I think so. I mean, it's, it's, it's um, I mean, first of all, it's just a wonder, this whole situation that we are somehow in. Mm. And we're so, uh, in a way, immune to the magic of it, which is so... You know, I couldn't live that way. I need to be, you know, where I can, um, you know, uh, I'm, we're doing my journals next, and, and, and at the last page, the editor left a the, the so far, they're cutting all kinds of stuff, but maybe they won't cut this. Uh, I was in Hawaii, and I was feeling, you know, how you get, you know, where you're just like, oh, God, you know. And I... I felt that the wind had come up outside the window and I went to the window and I looked out into a mango tree and the, there was a little nest of leaves, just a little nest of leaves and, and they, were, they were just doing like that, doing like that. And, and I was, you know, intrigued. And then I realized that actually it was speaking to me. And what it was saying was, oh, stop muttering about. Get on with it. <laughs> it's gonna be okay. And I and I realized that I had been telling the trees to give me more mangoes. I had been going out there every morning with my little bucket, and 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 they wouldn't. You know, well, one was a one tree was a male, so it didn't have any. I mean, even though I knocked, you know, but but the other one, I would say, you know, um, you know, mangoes. <laughs> <laughs> before I have to go home, you know. So, so the world that I live in is aware that the trees are constantly communicating. Now, they will figure this out later, probably. And I'm sure indigenous people have always known this. That they are communicating and that in the same way that they communicate to, them, to each other, that they all also communicate to us, but we have to be really open to it. 
you know. Um, so I don't know, you know, was that in part of your question? Yeah, well, yeah, it was, yeah, it was, whatever, whatever question was asked. <laughs> Um, you're a prolific voice, writer, womanist, a light source. What was it like in the beginning finding and standing in your voice? Did you know, believe you'd be who you are now? It was terrible sometimes. I was so suicidal. Oh, no, I mean, I, I have been down there, you know, really far. Um, but I'm not now. You know, and that's good. Mm -hmm. And also, that's, yeah, thank you. But that's what you learn. You learn that as you go along, and it's a good thing to know. In fact, when I hear of all the suicides, you know, I, my one hope and, and wish is that somebody had just been close enough to say, wait until tomorrow. You know, just, just hold on one more day and see what happens. This idea of knowing who you are now, though, being in your archives, like, I don't know if you knew you were going to be Alice Walker, but you kept everything. I mean, you kept it like you knew someone was going to go through your archives eventually. <laughs> so I do, and so this is just me adding to that question. Like, why did you do, did you know that, you know what I mean? Like, there was some, and Beverly and I talked about this, and Valerie and I talked about this, like, did you know you were going to be who you are in that way? Um, di it's different than, I, no, you didn't know. You just kept well, everything. Well, no, 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 no. <laughs> what I knew mm. was that I have a responsibility to the people coming after me. Mm. Mm. And if I can be helpful by leaving a map, mm. that's what I'll do. Mm. Mm -hmm. <laughs> Okay, so this is a two-part question, and then we have one more after this. So part one, do you have any writing rituals that you do before and after you write? And part two, are there any self-care rituals that you do before or after writing about trauma? And this is from a budding novelist. I think the writing is the therapy. I think the writing is the healing, and I think it's the joy, uh, and it's the magic because there is just something so remarkable about the process of writing out of nothing. I mean, where does it come from? You know, I mean, it's true that you can, you know, write a story based on whatever, or you can write a feature about something you actually experienced, but, but at another level, it's a kind of magic. Uh, and that is what I like. And to the extent that there is trauma, it's healing. I find that, you know, I heal myself all the time through my work, mm. you know. Mm. I mean, it's so wonderful to write something and then put on just some wonderful rocking music and just dance, you know, until I just feel completely free and silly and, you know, just fine. Uh, and dance, I think, is the closest I feel to what writing is. Hmm. So the last question, Alice, we love you. I love you, but this person loves you as well. Um, and their question is, you fill your skin with water, strength, and sweetness. What would you say to guide the next generation to find their way to their contribution? Well, you know, I... I worry about our youth not knowing their own beauty. And I worry about them not um, appreciating, you know, who they are and what has gone before them to hold them. I mean, we've, we've been holding these children. I mean, we've been, you know, it, it wasn't like, you know, just going out there for yourself and trying to vote with people who are shooting at you, you know, really. Uh, and at that time, I must tell you, and you know this, uh, there was, you know, more of a, an innocence about voting and our political situation. We have to all vote now, though. Yeah. Um, 
But it still doesn't mean we have to believe in the system. And I, I would really like, you know, to make that very um, much my contribution. <laughs> that that this, this will have to be a strategic vote and maybe there'll be many of those to come, but you can no longer rest at all after voting for anybody. You know, just forget about it. There is no, you know, one of the problems that we have had uh, is that we, you know, get a few, you know, nuggets of freedom, quote, and we just party. You know it's the truth. <laughs> and, you know, then they, you know, the Republicans, for instance, never sleep. Those people don't sleep. I mean, look at them, they don't. <laughs> But we do. <laughs> and, and we, you know, somehow we have really thought that, you know, freedom, once you get some, that's it, and you, you, everything is gonna be fine. It is never like that. It has never been like that. It never will be like that. So, you know, vote strategically when you have to, but never believe in it, mm. that it's gonna be the cure. It's not. So I guess that's the end of our time here. Um, well, thank you so much. I, I really know, enjoyed I, I, it. Yeah, it was beautiful. You're yeah. beautiful. <laughs> so are you. <laughs>